Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. In her previous appearance on this show, journalist Reniqua Allen discussed an opinion piece she had written that described the growing trend among African Americans, 37 years old and under, to leave the North, West, and Midwest, where their forebears came to escape from Southern racism, and return to the South. In her new book, It Was All a Dream, A New Generation Confronts the Broken Promise to Black America, Allen takes the discussion a step further, interviewing more than 75 black millennials in cities and towns across the country about the challenges they face in trying to attain the American dream. Does the notion that anyone can succeed and enjoy a prosperous life through hard work really apply to them? Or is it just that, only a dream? Welcome. Thanks for having me here, Cheryl. The thesis of your book seems to be that for African Americans of your generation, the American dream has proven to be something of a myth, uh, that there are more obstacles in the way of achieving that dream, and even if you do achieve it, it winds up being different from the American dream that white Americans of your generation can achieve. What's interesting, though, is you say that African Americans and Latinos believe in the American dream more than anybody else. It is so, I could not believe it. It's just so fascinating to me that, you know, this group of people, that young black people believe in the American dream so much. They are the ones that have actually benefited from it the least. I mean, young black people and, and black folk overall are suffering, right? Um, we aren't seeing the success I think that our parents thought we would. Things are still hard. Home ownership rates are still where they were. Like during segregation, we still see vast, vast, vast um, inequalities in things like unemployment, education. We have massive amounts of student debt. It's, it's really frustrating for me. And I think that, you know, as you know, for this generation overall, we're a frustrated lot, right? There's a whole, a lot of articles now on millennial burnout happening, how frustrated millennials are, millennials feeling left behind, that we but can't you, get home alone. But you're still holding fast to the dream. But we're still holding fast. And I think that is a uniquely black millennial um, trait, right? Mm -hmm. I think there is still this hope, right? Even though we had to like tell the world that black lives matter, that our lives matter, right? That came about during our generation. Um, Yet we still do have hope. We still believe in this idea of America, even though I think society keeps telling us, you know, I, I get it all the time. I mean, you know, writing about race, you should go back to Africa. But I think there is this idea that we still believe in America. We still believe in opportunity, despite how bad and frustrating it's been. And that's kind of a wonderful, amazing thing that we right. are still persisting. So we, we, we talked before about, you know, the growing numbers of uh, African Americans overall who are moving back to the South. Um, this idea that um, uh, no longer New York or California, but the Southern cities are the black Mecca. Cities like Atlanta, Washington, Raleigh, and Baltimore. You travel there. Yep. Uh, did you find evidence that southern cities are black mecca? Oh gosh, you know, it's a hard thing for me still because I, I live in New York City. I am a northerner, I'm from New Jersey. You know, it's hard for me. I see a lot of pain still in the south. Like it's hard for me to, you know, walk onto a plantation um, to see where slaves were housed, to see slave auction sites, that's painful. And right, I can walk down downtown in New York and there also, there's like a, you know, a slave burial ground. So I don't want to discount that. I still feel walking on the Upper East Side, I came from there right now, I, I still tighten up a bit. So I don't want to say that, you know, New York City is sort of some, is some kind of promised land. It definitely isn't. But what I did notice in the South is that feeling of community, is that feeling, I think, of a home, um, a feeling that I can go back generations and generations and my family is here and I don't necessarily feel that I think in, in New York City. It is kind of a remarkable thing. Uh, for the book, I actually traveled to Manning, South Carolina where my family is from and we have long left, right? They, they came to New York, they followed that kind of great migration pattern and 
I kind of did this search for home and it was a comfort there that I didn't quite feel. I don't know if it was because of just the small town, wonderful vibe. I met a black and white cop asking me for help. Like, I never see that in New York City. But are, but are blacks in the South, I mean, visiting there, visiting Atlanta, are blacks in, in the Southern cities, are they doing better economically? Do they have more homes? Do they have, uh, uh, you know, I mean, from, from watching The Real Housewives <laughs> of Atlanta, you think, you know, they live in, live in large, but, you know, maybe it's because it, from the, what they're getting paid for the show, so. Right, yeah, I think economically they are, particularly places like Washington, D.C., which some people argue whether it's the South or not. Like, I feel like if you can get sweet tea and grits, it is the, the South. South. Um, but, you know, and I went to school in D.C., so I love D.C., right? Prince George's County in D.C. had large rates of home ownership. Um, they still do, I think, supported particularly by the government. And there's, you know, a legacy of HBCUs, right? But so I do think there is an economic um, advantage that, that people have in the South, particularly areas, like I said, D.C. and Atlanta. However, I think it's also more than that. It's a community that people said they felt, that they didn't feel like, they were in the struggle. It was a hustle and bustle up here. And in the South, they could breathe. They had yeah. space. And that wasn't quite here in the North. Okay. Um, African-Americans have always been told that get a good education, specifically college education. That's the key to achieving the American dream. And it will take you into the middle class. Is that another myth? I think so for this generation. I mean, you look at the amount of student debt that young black people have. They are trying to go to college. They are trying to achieve that. But for various number of reasons, people have a lot of black folk in general have a hard time even finishing college, right? And when they do finish college, they're not necessarily guaranteed a job. Unemployment for black college graduates were double than it was for white uh, college graduates, right? So there's an inequality there as well. And it's a frustrating place, I think, for me. They feel like they've been sold a dream, right? And I think underemployment is something that this generation, regardless of race, faces. But I think it's even more extreme for young yeah, people. Yeah, I think there was a figure that uh, maybe it was, um, even with college degrees, um, African Americans have a higher unemployment rate than whites with only high school yeah, diplomas. Yeah, that's crazy. It's amazing. But, you, but I should say that with a caveat, because right, despite all the burdens of college that, and the obstacles that so many young black millennials face, if they don't go to college, there's actually, you know, all the statistics find that they don't make as, enough money. They, right. I'm sorry, they don't make as much money. Um, that, you know, their chances of finding a job are even lower. So right. it's kind of, you know. Which brings a, us a to, I mean, you wrote a book about uh, blacks who are in the underground economy. Um, because that's the only place they have found that they can survive uh, economically. Yeah, for a, lot of, for a lot of them, unfortunately, that is the case. And for across the board, people have tried jobs in the, in the illicit economy. They tried to get good jobs. One uh, young woman who you know, turned to sex work. Miss V? M no, this is the person I'm thinking of is Alicia. Okay. Um, but Miss V is also a good example. But Alicia. She's a dominatrix with a dom master's degree. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, and master's. And, and she did it because she needed help. Miss V did it because she needed help paying tuition. Right. Alicia, you know, was telling me how she was working, you know, cleaning, a house cleaning job. She was working like a fast food job. Uh, she had some other, you know, kind of a uh, call center job, and she still wasn't making ends meet. She was hustling and tired and working nonstop. And so she entered sex work and, you know, for her, she said, I made, you know, the money in one night that I was making in a whole week working three jobs around the clock. Do you think sex work should be, uh, should be decriminalized? Oh, absolutely. I think they work hard. Um, I think it is a job, and Alicia particularly is a testament of just how dangerous the job is. She is now sitting in jail for um, what seems like self-defense. Right. And the death of unions, you know, uh, you, you had a union uh, that protected you and you could get good wages. And now there are just a lot of low paying jobs where you work a lot of hours and you barely make a living. And you have no protections. I you mean, no protection. a lot of the young people that I spoke to in these jobs, one, I was shocked, you know, they, they liked their jobs. They didn't mind the work. One housekeeper said, I like making things look pretty. I, I like doing it, but I just want to be able to have health care. And I right. think that everyone should have that. And I think this may be also a generational thing where our parents don't necessarily know how to talk to us about these things because 
they came of age when they could get a high school degree and come out and have a job with a pension and work for it for 20 or 30 years. And they could take their vacation once a year. They could buy a home. They weren't scrambling and hustling the way, you know, we are, like many of us still right. into our 30s. And I also, I think, for black baby boomers, uh, getting the college education did help you move up. Right. You know, it, 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 it was a... It wasn't a myth right, right, for, right. For, for those. You write about incarcer incarceration as being a stumbling block to African Americans uh, who are pursuing the dream. Yeah, man. I mean, the rates are just off the charts for young black people in jail. And I should say men and, and women are rates are, you know, it has an unbelievable impact on young black people, the black community, not only when we're talking about, you know, maybe people not growing up with fathers or mothers, but how we can have relationships. It just impacts our lives in a, in a way that I think it, it does in others. And, you know, there's stops to the police officers stopping you. There's a fear that I think young black people have that others don't have. So while, yes, millennials in general are worried about not, you know, economic insecurity, um, you know, delaying things like marriage, we also have to worry about like, can we get home safe at night? And that's something that, that's an extra burden that I don't think right. is often And getting sucked about. into the criminal justice getting system, sucked often into for, it. for minor uh, offenses. Absolutely, one young man, you know, got a ticket, ended up in Rikers and it was cleared, but it took two years to clear. And the, the burden of just having that ticket, an open case, an open felony case um, that had not been decided on his record, he was, unable to get a job for years. Yeah, yeah. You, one bright spot you say is the internet. You say that's a space where younger African Americans can exist on their own terms. Yeah, and yeah. And realize some of their dreams. Yeah, so. I think things like black Twitter has given a whole group of people a voice. So you look at someone like Cardi B who came about just making videos on the internet and now she is actually talking about the government shutdown. Cardi is 100%, you know, um, a, a, what you would call a black millennial. I mean, it really has empowered this generation and this group of people that I feel um, were so invisible for a long time and then are still largely invisible. I don't want to act like, you know, this is like, there's a Cardi B and now all of a sudden, you know, the black experience is understood. It's definitely not. Yeah, and the internet is a place where you can have blogs, you can do community organizing, activism, um, you can, uh, showcase your music, you can publish your books, you can make connections, share your feelings, do yes, all things. Yes, it's great, but I should also say that's another thing that comes with a caveat, right? So it's a great space, but also a lot of young people don't feel like it's so safe for them anymore. They are subject to attacks because of their race or because of their beliefs. So, and outside of that, there's also a pressure to be and act a certain way because it feels like the internet is forever. Yeah. So, you know, there's less room for error. And I mean, young black people, I think, don't have room for error in general. Um, they can't be like that young man in, uh, in, uh, in DC this past week. And we can't make mistakes and go on the Today Show. Um, so I think it's a really tough, tough place for, for us sometimes as well. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with author Reniqua Allen after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Reniqua Allen, author of It Was All a Dream, A New Generation Confronts the Broken Promise to Black America. You write that black middle class professionals are, quote, the ultimate contradiction of the American dream. Yeah, I mean, it is tough to be young and black and I think upwardly mobile and still struggling, right? People think that you have achieved the dream, you have made you got it. got it made. You've got it made and basically everyone told me the opposite. You know, they still worry about, and the, the phrase I heard the most, as I said, was, we have to be twice as hard. Tw we have to work twice as hard. We have to be twice as good. That was the thing over and over and over again. They told me that, yeah, I maybe look like I have success, but I also have a lot of burdens. I have to take care of my mom or, you know, I don't have a house to inherit. 
inherit. Um, I still worry about predatory lending or my name, you know, being overlooked on a job application. They still had it just as hard. And, and I think even more so, people didn't understand their experience because it looked like they have success. Right. So how do you explain that? Right. And I think, and, and, and Ellis Coase brought this out as yep. you, as you uh, mentioned in The Rage of a Privileged Class. You also have to do, deal with the stupid things that white people say and do to you every day. Right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, it's hard, and particularly for this generation now, because it doesn't look like someone's calling me the N-word. It doesn't look like I can't use this water fountain. It's subtle, and it's not... It's something like, oh, that doesn't sound right. Like, but you know, how do you actually report that and talk to a HR person about that? And they didn't know how to navigate mm -hmm. that. People were in tough situations because, you know, I think that people still don't get what microaggressions are. Like, you know, they they believe, okay, yes, we will deal with a racist if if that's there, but if it's something that's doesn't. It, it's, you know, they're, it's gray. We're, we don't really know how to deal with right. it. And that was a hard place for people to be. I often uh, uh, compare being black to, you know, uh, driving a car down the highway and then all of a sudden you hit a bump, <laughs> you know, in the road and it just sort of throws you yeah, off. Right. You know, Absolutely. and this happens, you know, repeatedly. You think well, you're doing great and it, pow. Jaleesa, uh, one of your sources, who made it out of the Bronx, got to college, into the middle class. I think she's in marketing? Uh, yeah, she's okay. in, yeah, she's in marketing. Um, said achieving the dream for African Americans is more likely to be just a matter of luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I, I want people, because I don't think that the general public understands how much work it takes for young black people to be successful and how and I use successful in quotes, right? Because success obviously means different things. But to get these jobs, to not go crazy every day because the world is so tough on them, um, it takes an extraordinary amount of persistence and hard work. It's hard for anyone now, I think, to achieve even the traditional monikers of success. And it is doubly hard for young black people to do it. They are held to a standard. I mean, you look at on the cover of my book, there's Barack Obama, right? He, his standard is so different of the presidency than I think, you know, the person who sits in office now. Um, Barack Obama had to be you know, almost the perfect candidate. Um, but also you're saying that it's more than just hard work and being perfect. It's, you know, getting a break, getting somebody who yeah. hooks you up or takes an interest in you right. uh, and... Yeah, and black folk have less people to hook them Make, up. Right. Right, who give them that break, who see themselves, you know, maybe say, oh, I'll give this young person a chance. And, right, right. And Jaleesa definitely um, honed in on that. African Americans, African American millennials, well, African Americans in general, seem to, it, it seems that there has been considerable progress in the entertainment area. If you're looking at the movies, if you're looking at television, I... Uh, what do you have to say about that? What did you find? I think it's all on the surface. I mean, you look at really? the, you look at the number. Yes, I think we're doing better. Like you know, in some ways, there's Black Panther that just got nominated for an Academy. Um, you know, there's Issa Rae, who I love. I talk about her a lot. Um, and Donald Glover, Lena Waithe. There's a whole kind of crop of young Black millennials. But right, but you look at like who has the power in the studios, who actually greenlights these projects, and they're not black folk. They're actually largely white men. And I think, you know, for film and television studios, the numbers are both well above 94, I think, 93% um, of, of those people being white men. Um, so I, I don't want to get it, like, twisted in any way that, you know, we, when you think about, yes, who is in front of the camera, sure, but who holds the power, that's like a different thing, and that's not us. Blacks in the business, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, on the screen, the bigger, big screen or the small screen, complain that it's hard to be their authentic selves, while well, we're talking about movies, in Hollywood. Uh, isn't it hard for anybody to be their authentic selves in Hollywood? Oh, I think the burden is so much more, I, particularly in that chapter, I remember a young woman telling me that she felt like she had to be so on point, so together, because her boss had never worked with any other black people before. 
um, he'd never had a black executive assistant. And she said, I feel like I have to represent my race because there are so few of us here. Yeah. So, yes, I do agree that, you know, that is something that people in general worry about, of, of being their authentic selves. But for us, it's, well, how do I present? Well, how am I going to to make folks understand my experience, but without being whatever it is, you know, too black or sounding too white or whatever it is. And I think it's because people genuinely don't understand what it's like to be black in America, which doesn't mean one thing for one person. It means 20 zillion different things. But because that experience, because our voices are, are, aren't understood, because our bodies aren't understood, because our language isn't understood, I think there's a real pressure to feel like we have to make ourselves accessible or understandable in a way, particularly to white people and other people of color sometimes. Love, marriage, relationships, um, are those harder to achieve for African-American millennials and for other millennials? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think for young black people, because we have these other burdens, because we have to worry about like, you know, not just paying rent, but surviving like the NYPD, um, we're stressed, like we're stressed and we're depressed. Um, and I, I heard a lot of that, we're anxious. And I think of course those things make it harder to achieve, right? Like financial stability is hard in relationships and marriages. Uh, that, you know, obviously is one of the leading causes of, of divorce. And when you don't have that, I think that that is, that's really rough. And the young black folk, I mean, then there's, you know, things like colorism, there's things like Instagram and, you know, social media and, you know. The baggage that African-Americans carry is yeah. pretty heavy. Absolutely. And you can see it on their faces if you see, well, you know, watching people walking down the street, in a subway, you know. Absolutely. It weighs you down. What did you discover that most surprised you in your research? That young black folk were really feeling anxious, depressed. A lot of people talked to me about wanting to commit suicide, which I hadn't even asked about. Um, and it showed up in various, it, basically across all chapters, no matter what we were talking about. Like, no one chapter was about student debt, and he ended up talking about how depressed he was. Yeah. That was shocking to me. And, how, and also how willing people were to talk about it. Yeah. But also people didn't actually sometimes have resources to deal with that. And so that was kind of scary. Can you tell me about one person, perhaps, who felt that they have achieved the American dream? One person is Shamir, this young guy in the Hollywood chapter um, who, had a, who, who did a first, his first album. He recorded it and, um, and found some mainstream success with it and didn't feel like he could be his authentic self. They wanted him to be like this kind of queer pop person. And he's like, yeah, I'm queer, but I want to do a different you know, sound of music and ended up um, leaving like Hollywood, leaving California. And uh, he decided to record an album in a room by himself, lo-fi as a sound, um, in four days and released it. And, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, it became widespread after that. And he was so happy. He said that, you know, I feel like I can do what I want, I can get my voice out there. I don't have to you know, go through this kind of traditional means and, and be happy and that's something powerful and amazing and he felt like he had achieved the dream okay. because of that. So what's the answer to the question that you set out to answer? Is it possible for African-American millennials to achieve the American dream? And I think you, you give your best answer in your last, <laughs> the best answer that you can in your la the last paragraph of your book, which I would like you to read. Sure. I wanted this book to answer the question Jay-Z had asked back in 2002 when he remixed Biggie's classic, Juicy. I wanted to figure out if this was all a dream, if success was possible, but it feels like the current American nightmare, my current American nightmare, isn't helping, me, helping give me any clarity at all. Sure, technology has helped. We have figured out a way to be visible in some spaces but our humanity remains unseen. We've strategized and suffered, made careers out of what seemed to be nothing. When the media wasn't paying attention to us, we made our own shows. We stepped out on faith, we survived, and we endured. We've experienced pain, but we've also experienced joy. 
I could end with a bunch of policy proposals you've probably heard before. I can throw in some so-called radical ones like reparations, cures for post-traumatic slave syndrome, or simply burning the whole country down, as many seem to advocate today. Or I could, as we've done in the past, have faith that somehow this generation will figure it out, as black folks always have had to do. Perhaps it doesn't matter whether our dreams are real or not. We'll claw our way to the top, despite being called monkeys, nappy-headed hoes, gorillas, bitches, ungrateful and uppity Negroes, and we'll make it. Perhaps hip-hop has always had the answer to my question. If I look to our history, I see that we have always risen, always rocked it, and always done more with less. We're survivors like Beyonce, fighters like Serena, fly like Drake, and as Kendrick Lamar said, we gonna be all right. So it's, up, up, so it's ultimately an optimistic answer, and I hope you're right. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. I wanna thank Reniqua Allen for joining me today. Her book, It Was All a Dream, A New Generation Confronts the Broken Promise to Black America, published by Nation Books, is available online and in stores now. For One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>